What's up developers, it's Dario here and today I want to start off with my Tailwind Crash Course since I've used it in previous videos but I never created a course and I thought it was time to do so. Before we continue on, I want to quickly let you know that you can support the channel through Patreon where you can get access to my private Discord group where everyone is helping each other out with their coding issues. So if you are interested to join, the link is in the description down below. On my channel, I've used a little bit Tailwind before without explaining it in depth. And that was actually something that kept bothering me. Therefore, I decided to create a Tailwind course. I expect all of you guys to understand what CSS is, how it works, and what you can do with it. You don't need to be a pro in it, and I'm definitely not going to ask you to create a slick website with keyframes and so on. But it is good to understand what most of the basic stuff is, since I'm not going to cover CSS elements. So what is Tailwind? Tailwind is a CSS utility framework that makes your life as a front and backend developer a lot easier. And yes, I'm saying as a backend developer as well, since you don't need to write your own CSS anymore. You can see Tailwind as a predefined CSS file where you find loads of CSS classes that you can use to style your elements by just adding classes inside your HTML tags. And that doesn't mean that you need to learn every single class name out of your head. Tailwind code is very, very easy to understand. If you practice it a little bit, you will see a pattern in the class names and you will get used to it really quick. A big go for me is the official documentation of Tailwind on their website, where you can find all the styling of a specific topic if you search it in the navbar. But that's something for another video. As you can see on my screen right now, we have one file open, which is the example.html file, which is the .html extension. And you can see that we added classes inside our div, anchors, and image tags. And that's what Tailwind does. Just like any other framework, there are advantages and disadvantages by using Tailwind. And I'm not the type of developer that says that you need to use Tailwind instead of Bootstrap or whatever. Just like any other framework, there are advantages and disadvantages. I'm not the type of developer that says that you need to use Tailwind instead of Bootstrap or whatever. In my opinion, every language or framework has its own advantages and disadvantages. In my personal opinion, a huge advantage of Tailwind is the fact that it is very easy to prototype, iterate and customize. You can easily change something like your font size without harming the rest of your application. Choosing Tailwind over vanilla CSS makes the process so much faster since you don't need to write down every single styling in your application, especially for backend developers. To keep it polite, creating your own CSS is a pain in the butt. Therefore, using built-in classes will make your development phase a lot easier. The last advantage that I will mention is the fact that you can add specific behavior in particular cases. Inside vanilla CSS, you need to define your hover in a new set of styling. But in Tailwind, you can easily add the hover prefix which will apply hover on a specific element. Now that we have talked Tailwind into heaven, I must admit that there are some cons when using Tailwind, especially if you're new to it. Don't worry, the developers that are working on Tailwind are incredible since they update it on a regular basis. With Tailwind, you're going to add your CSS classes inside your HTML markup. And I remember when I started using Tailwind, it was honestly pretty annoying to read my HTML code because it might get a bit cluttered. I tried to create the best code example as possible, and as you can see on my screen, it can be very annoying to find, let's say, your border bottom, which is the border B in the first div that we got. If you are a developer that haven't worked with CSS before, it might be difficult at the beginning to get a good understanding of what everything means. Most people rely on a framework like Bootstrap that will do the work for you. In my previous videos where I've used Tailwind, I've got a ton of reactions from people asking me why I chose to use Tailwind instead of Bootstrap. And to be honest, there is a big difference between Tailwind and Bootstrap. Whenever you write Bootstrap, you're using classes whose name describe how they are going to be used. You use names such as a container, role, call, card, and it's a little bit different in Tailwind since you're creating a single styling for a specific element. Now let me show you an example in code. Let's say that you want to create a primary button inside your application. In Bootstrap, you create something like this a button with a class of btn and another class name called btn-primary. If we create the same exact button in Tailwind, you can see that the class name of your button is a bit longer. You have a background color of 500, you have a hover statement, you have text-white, 
the font is bold, the padding Y axis is 2, the padding axis 4, and the border is rounded. Bootstrap looks simpler, but the BTN that's being used is predefined, and that's something that does bother me every once in a while. You don't want to use the same exact button for every scenario. What if you want to make your button different? That's why I prefer Tailwind over Bootstrap. And don't roast or hate me, I'm saying that I prefer Tailwind over Bootstrap. If you have a different opinion, comment down below why. Now it looks pretty easy, right? To add a class of BTN, BTN-primary to your Bootstrap class. But have you ever thought about what goes on behind the scenes? If we take the same exact button and show the classes, you can see a lot of styling elements right here inside the .btn and the .btn-primary. If we compare this to Tailwind, for instance, you can see that we have six different classes that we called, and all of them have one or two lines of styling added to it. There are multiple ways how we could set up our Tailwind project, but I will install it as a post-CSS since it's one of the most common ways in real-life applications. For this series, I decided to go with Visual Studio Code since it's free and very easy to use. I won't create a tutorial on how to set it up since it's just one extension that you need, which is Tailwind CSS IntelliSense. Since this course is mainly focused on designing, we won't be needing the command line interface that much, so I want to use the integrated CLI in Visual Studio Code instead of my external terminal. This will save me a lot of time because I don't need to switch between screens. So first things first, let's open our code editor. Let's remove the welcome screen. Uh, let me actually zoom in. Inside the top menu of our Visual Studio Code, there's a menu item right here called Terminal. And I think it's the same for every operating system. Let's click on it. And in the dropdown, let's click on New Terminal, which will open an integrated terminal. Before we write down a command, we need to set up a new project folder since it won't be done automatically for us. So. What we could do is to write down cd to my desktop. In my desktop, I can write down ls. And as you can see, I have one folder right here. I can even show it to you. Right here, I have one folder called workspace. Let's cd into our workspace because in here, I pretty much store any type of project that I got, whether it's a Python project, Laravel project, or a basic HTML and CSS project. I prefer to use this way since it is pretty annoying to search for projects on my laptop. You are not obligated to do the same exact thing. Your Tailwind project will run from anywhere. Inside our workspace, we need to create a new directory. So let's write down mkdir for make a new directory called personal underscore portfolio. Hit enter. If we write down ls right now, you can see that we have a new project here called personal underscore portfolio. So let's cd into personal portfolio. Let me make it full screen. All right. Like I said, we're going to use npm to install Tailwind, so we obviously need to make sure that we got npm running. If you're not entirely sure if you got npm installed, you can run npm-v. This will return either an npm version, and as you could see for me, it's 7.14, or you will get an error message which says that you don't have npm running. Don't worry, since it's very easy to install NPM on your local machine. Now, before I continue on, you need to make sure that you have Node.js installed on your local machine. And it's very easy to do that. I've already opened it in the browser. You need to go to node.js.org, download the latest version on your PC, pause the video, and I'll see you back in Visual Studio Code if you got it installed. Now that you probably just installed Node.js, you can run NPM-V again in the terminal, to see your version and based on that, you can see if you got Node running or not. Now that we got it running, it's time to install npm. Inside the terminal, you basically need to run npm install. And I've already got it installed, but this is basically installing npm. If you're not running on npm 7.14, it really doesn't matter. But if you do want to update it, you basically need to write down npm install dash g space npm and this will upgrade your npm version whenever you have done that you can write down npm dash v again to check the version and once again it's tail 7.14 right now we are ready to pull in our tailwind packages but before i do that i want to open my project to the side right here so let's open the explorer 
and let's open a folder. Go to my desktop, workspace, and my personal portfolio folder. And let's close off welcome again. And apparently we need to open the terminal again. Let's go to the CLI because we need to perform a new npm command. Let's write down npm install space dash d. Then we need to define what we would like to pull in. And in our case, it's tailwind CSS. Let's also add a at sign to it because we're going to tell npm that we want to install the latest version. So let's add a at latest. In the previous video, I've told you that I prefer to pull in Tailwind as a post CSS plugin. So what we need to do is to add a space, write down post CSS, and once again, we're going to add the latest version. We need to add one more thing before we can run this command. Tailwind CSS does not automatically add vendor prefixes to the CSS. Tailwind itself recommends you to install auto prefixes. So let's do that. Let's add a space. Let's say auto prefixer. And once again, we want to install the latest version. Now let's run this command to see what the output is. This might take a second. NPM returned a message where it says that NPM info is okay. Let me close off my Git repo. All right. If we take a look at the left side of our VS code and inside our personal portfolio folder where our project folder is located, you can see that one new folder called node underscore modules and two files called package dash lock and package .json have been added. The node modules folder is a package manager for node.js. We won't be doing much with it, but it is needed to have. And I'll let you know in a bit why. Inside the package.json file, you can find the dependencies and the associated versions that we pulled in. Our auto prefixes is on 10.2.5, post CSS is on 8.3, and our Tailwind CSS is on 2.1.2. The next step is to create our configuration file, which can be done through the CLI as well. So let's go there. Let's write down mpx Tailwind CSS in it. This is not necessary to do right now, but we will need it later on. So let's do it right now. Let's hit enter. And as you can see, a tailwind.convic.js file has been created for us. Now the next step is to create our CSS file because we need to pull in Tailwind directives. So inside the root of our project, let's create a new file called style.css. And inside the style.css file, we need to add Tailwind directives that will be replaced with Tailwind code. And in order to do that, we need to say add Tailwind space base, and we need to close it off with a semicolon. We need to do it two more times. So on the line below, let's say at Tailwind. And the second name is Components. And the last one is the at Tailwind again. And the file name is called Utilities. You might wonder where these three files are coming from. The base, components, and utilities. And let me show that to you. The at Tailwind will look inside the node underscore modules folder. Let's open it. It will search for a folder called Tailwind. So let's scroll down to the T. Right here, let's open it. And in here, you can see a base.css file, our utilities.css file, and our components.css file. The next step is to reprocess these files inside a new file. And this can be done in multiple ways, but the way I prefer is to create a script inside our package.json, which allows us to pretty much create a new command that we then can run inside the CLI. Let's make our node module smaller again. Let's open the package.json file. And right below our closing curly brace of our dependency, we need to add a semicolon. On the line below, we're going to create something which is called, in double quotes, called scripts. After a double quote, we need to add a colon and we need to add a set of curly braces. We need to pass a name and value. So let's call the name in single quotes, build-css. Now the value, so colon, is tailwind CSS, space, build, space, what we want to build. So the style.css file that we got. Then we need to add a dash all flag, since we're going to specify the output file. And in my case, we want to store it inside a new folder called CSS, forward slash, style.css. And I forgot to add a space here. All right, this looks better. 
Let's save it. And then inside the terminal, we need to run the script that we just created. So let's say npm run build-css. The build-css that we're performing right here refers to the script that we got right here. So let's run it. It's building right now. And that was actually pretty fast. It has been done. So as you can see, a new folder called CSS has been created. Let's open it with a file called style.css. All right, you can see that we have a lot of styling right here. And to make sure that it is Tailwind, let's press Command or Control F and let's search for Tailwind. And as you can see, the Tailwind custom reset styles have been added. In web design, typography is a very important subject since you're going to display text to a reader. Now in order to showcase you how you can play around with font sizes, we obviously need an index.html file. So inside the root of our directory, let's create a new file called index.html. Now in here, we need our HTML template, so let's write down doc and hit tab. Alright. Now first of all, we need to link our style sheets from the CSS folder. So right below our title, let's create a link. And the href is css forward slash style dot css. Now the next thing that we need to do is to create a div inside our body with some text inside of it. So let's create a div. Inside the div, we have another div. And inside the second div, we're going to style an h1 with the text of welcome to my Tailwind course. Uh, let me actually outline it on the line below so it's easier to read for you guys. Right below my h1, I want to create a subtitle of a h2, which says created by code with Dari. Right below our h2, let's create a paragraph of lorem ipsum. If we save it, right click on index.html, reveal it in the finder, and let's right click on index.html and let's open it with a browser. It really doesn't matter which one you use, I prefer to use Brave. Brave one to access my files. Let's allow it and let's make it full screen. And let me actually zoom in a little bit. All right. By default, you can see that the font family has been changed in a regular index.html file. There are three classes that you could use to control the font family of an element. And what I want to do is to add each of them to our headers and paragraph tags. So let's go back to Visual Studio Code for our H1. Let's give it a class name of font-sans. For our h2, I want to apply a new class of font-serif, which is the serif font. And for our paragraph, I want to create a new class as well called font-mono. If we save it and go back to the browser, refresh it, you can see that we have three different fonts for our text. Our welcome to my Tailwind course has been changed to sans. Our created by code with Dari has been changed to serif. And our paragraph has been changed to mono. If we take a look at the classes that we added, you can see a pattern that you'll see throughout the entire course. The first word of the class defines what we're going to do. As you can see, we're going to do something with our font. After the dash, you'll be adding a specific value that is related to the font. So saints, serif, mono, and so on. So what I like to do right now is to remove all the classes because it's not necessary. It was just to showcase you what type of fonts we do have. The next topic is the size of a font. And for that, I would like to go to the official documentations of Tailwind. So let's open a new tab and let's go to tailwindcss.com. To be honest, this site is incredible. If you'd like to search up something that you don't know, you can just click on the search bar inside the top menu, search for, let's say, font. Inside the drop-down menu, you can see all the different documentations on font classes. The one that we need is called the font size. Now right here, you can see a table with a class and a property. Let me actually zoom in a little bit. On the left hand side of the table that appeared, you can see the class name that you can apply on your HTML tags. On the right hand side, you'll be seeing the properties that are defined within the class. The class with the lowest font size is text-xs, which stands for extra small. The highest is, well let's scroll down, 
text-9xl, which is nine times extra large. As you can see, there is a text-base. This is the default text size that you're going to use. So for our H1, let's say that we want to apply text-3xl, which will define the CSS properties of font size, which will be equal to 1.875 rem and a line height of 2.25. That means that the font size will be 1.875 times bigger than the default font size of our root element. Now let's go back to Visual Studio Code. Let's give it a class of text-3xl. Save it, refresh the browser, and as you can see, Welcome to my Tailwind course has been printed out a way bigger than it was. Now for our H2, let's add a class of text-extra-large. Save it, go back to the browser, refresh it, and it got a little bit bigger since it has been multiplied by 1.25. Now for our paragraph, let's give it a class of text LG, which stands for large. So let's save it, go back to the browser, refresh it, and you can see that it got a little bit bigger. Now you might wonder why every font size has line height defined, since the goal is to make your text bigger. And the answer is very simple. It has been created to keep the spacing consistent throughout your application. Besides the font size, you can also format the text by changing the thickness. You can add utility classes to format the text by changing the text to italic or add or remove an underline. So let's do that. Let's go back to Visual Studio Code. For our H1, let's give it a class of font-bold. For our H2, let's give it a class of underline. Save it. Go back to Brave. Refresh it. And you can see that our H1 is bold. And we added an underline for our subtitle. Now there's one more left, which is italic. And let's add that to our paragraph. So let's say italic. Save it. Go to Brave. Refresh it, and our paragraph has been changed to italic. There's also a utility class called not-italic to make something, well, obviously not italic. So what we could do is to go to Visual Studio Code, and let's wrap this word right here into a span. So at the beginning, let's add a span. Let's copy the words and place it in between. And let's give a class to our span called not-italic. If we save it and go back to the browser, refresh it, you can see that consecutor is not italic, but the rest of the sentence is. Now, besides the font dash bold that we added in our H1, we could use one of the nine CSS provided grades of boldness. If we go back to the official website of Tailwind, write down font weight, open the first link that we get, you can see the nine different font weights that we could use. The default one is font-normal, which has a font weight of 400. Now the smallest one is font-tin, which has a font weight of 100. And the highest is font-black, which has the highest font weight of 900. If we navigate to our Visual Studio Code, change font-bold to font-black, save it, go back to our local host, refresh it, and you can see that Welcome to My Tailwind course is a little bit thicker than it was before. Let's say that we want to add font-tin for our paragraph. Let's do that. Right after italic, let's say font-tin. Save it. Go back to Brave. Refresh our local host. And you can see that the paragraph is extremely thin right now. There are also four different Tailwind utility classes to change the case type of a specific font. Now let's say that you want to set your h1 to uppercase and you want your h2 to be lowercase. If we go back to Visual Studio Code, we could add a new class to our h1 called uppercase. And for our h2, let's give it a class of lowercase. Save it, go to Brave, refresh it. Every single character in our h1 has been transferred to an uppercase. And inside our h2, every single character has been transferred to a lowercase. Even the C that we added as a capital inside our Visual Studio Code, as you can see right here. It's also possible to capitalize all the first letters of our word. And inside our paragraph, let's add capitalize. 
save it, go to Brave, refresh it, and as you can see, every first letter of a new word has been capitalized. Now the last one, which is the default one, is called, well, let's replace our H1 to normal dash case. Save it, go back to Brave, and it's been printed out just as it was in our Visual Studio code. Now that we've talked about all the different font utility classes, it's time to talk about the text color utility. If we go back to the browser and search for text color inside Tailwind CSS, you'll be finding a total of 90 color utilities that you could use inside this list. I want to start off by talking about the first four on the list. The first one is called text-transparent, which will obviously make the text transparent. This is pretty cool to use whenever you have a background image and you want to see the background color through the text. But this is something that we will add later on. The text current will keep the current color that you have added. Now the third one is text-black, which will change the color to the hex code of 000000. And the fourth one is text-white, which will change it to the FFFFFF color. If we scroll through the list, you can see a total of eight different colors. We got blue, gray, green, indigo, pink, purple, red, and yellow. If we look at the class names, you can see that every class starts with the word text, which implies that we're going to do something with the fonts. Then the second word is the color. So yellow, green, we got blue right here, and that was the last, oh no, that was not the last one. We got indigo, and so on. Now the last value inside the class name is the level of your color. The lightest level starts at 50, as you can see right here. And if you scroll down, you can see that the highest value is 900, which will be the darkest point of your color. Let's test it out. Let's go back to Visual Studio Code. And in our H1, let's change the color to text-blue-700. Save it. Go back to Brave. Refresh it. And you can see that our color has been changed to blue. Now for our H2, let's add a color of text-green-200, which will be very light. Let me show it to you. All right. And for our paragraph, let's change the color to text-gray-200. Let's say 600. Save it. Refresh the browser. You can see that the color is a little bit lighter. The last topic that I want to discuss in this video is text alignment, since it is something I personally use a lot when using vanilla CSS for text. By default, text is aligned to the left, as you could see. But there might be cases where you want to align your text in the middle or to the right. And in order to do that, let's go back to Tailwind. Let's search for text alignment. And as you can see, there are four values, text-left, text-center, text-right, and justify. So let's test them out. Let's go back to Visual Studio Code. Let's change our H1 to text-center. Save it, go back to the browser, refresh it, and you can see that our H1 has been placed in the middle. Now for our H2, let's place it to the right, save it, Refresh it, and our H2 has been placed to the right side, which does not make sense, but you get the point. And the last one is text justify. Let's apply that to our paragraph. Let's say text dash justify. Now what this will do is basically inline the paragraph to the left and right edges inside the paragraph. First off, I want to start off at a basic level. So we're going to talk about background colors first. After that, we're going to cover heights and widths. I wasn't sure if I should have added it in this video, but I think that it will suit pretty well when creating a background. Then we're going to add a new background color, but this time it will be a little bit different since we're going to add a gradient color. So before I waste any more time with you, let's get right into the content. If we navigate back to the browser and search for background color, you can see a new item right here that we can click on. So let's click on it. And let me actually zoom in. Right here, you can see all the classes and the associated properties for background colors. And as you can see, there is a pretty clear pattern right here, or similarity to the text color. 
When working with text, you define the keyword text first, followed by the color, and then the level of your color. With the background, it is exactly the same, but instead of writing down the entire word background, you can write down a shortcut called BG, which stands for the background. And that's actually with everything in Tailwind. Everything that's related to text starts with text, and everything that's related to the background starts with BG. And that was pretty easy, wasn't it? So let's apply it into our index.html file. If we navigate back to Visual Studio Code, you can see that we got an h1, h2, and a paragraph inside our parent element. But what I would like to do right now is to remove it since it's not related to this video. So let me remove everything. All right. Then inside our parent element, so the first div, we're going to add a class of bg-gray-500. If we save it and go back to Brave, open our local host and refresh it, you can see that nothing has been added, which is pretty weird. So let's see what's going on right there. If we inspect our page right now, open the element that we need. So let me zoom in right here because it's pretty small. All right, inside the body, we have a div class called bg gray 500 which is all right. If we scroll down, you can indeed see that in the styling, our background color should have been applied. But if we click on our BG gray, you can see that it has a width of 862 pixels by zero in height in the top left corner. So what we need to do right now is to set the height and width to our element. If you're familiar with CSS, you know that it can be difficult at times to play around with your height and width. With Tailwind, it's a lot easier since it obviously provides utilities for it. So inside the browser, let's open background-color for Tailwind. And inside the search bar, let's search for width. Right here, you can see a bunch of class names with properties assigned to it. The classes always start with a W, which obviously stands for width. Then there is a dash, followed with a fixed size based on the size and scale. W-0 stands for zero width. W-PX stands for one pixel. And let's skip 0 0.5 for one second, and let's focus on width-1, this line right here. As you can see, width-1 is equal to 0 0.25 rem. And as you can see, width-2 is equal to 0 0.5 rem. Width-3 has a rem of 0 0.75, and so on. This goes up until you reach width-96. Whenever you want to define the width based on rem, you can go up to a maximum of 96, which will be equal to a rem of 24. Besides the pixels that you can define or the rem that you can define, there's also a width-auto right here, which stands for auto sizing. Besides the fixed options that I just showed you, you can also add relative width options, and this will be a percentage, so basically in pixels. With one forward slash two, you're saying that the width should be 50%. One forward slash three, you're saying that it should be 33%, is one third of 100. And I hope that you're getting the point since there's a lot of options you could add. Before we test it out in Visual Studio Code, there are four more classes that I would like to show you. If we scroll down to the bottom of the list, right here, you can see that we have a width-full, width-screen, a width minimum, and a width maximum. With the width-full, we're setting the width equal to 100% of the parent container. We have width-screen, which is a width of 100 VW, which stands for viewport. And this is something that we'll talk about later on while making a responsive design. What CSS allows you to do is to specify the minimum and maximum width of an element. It is very limited in Tailwind, but it is good enough to make sure that your design will look good. I don't want to go over the height, since it's exactly the same, but the W is replaced with an H, which represents height. If we navigate back to Visual Studio Code, we can basically say that our parent container, so with the bg gray 500 now let me actually zoom in, all right, has a width-full, so the width is the entire page, and let's also set the height equal to full. So we're adding a 100 width and height to our parent element. If we save it, navigate back to the browser and refresh our local host, 
mine is on autosave. You can see that our background color has been changed to gray with a level of 500. And in my honest opinion, it's a bit dark, which makes me sad. So let's go back to Visual Studio Code and let's change gray to blue. Save it, go to Brave. And as you can see, the background color has been changed to blue. Now there might be a case where you want to add opacity to your background. So let's say that we got a background image behind our blue background and you only want to see a thin blue layer on top of your image. What we could do for that is to go back inside our Visual Studio class. I just add my classes that are related to each other and next to each other. So what we could do right here is to basically say that our BG, so our background dash opacity has a level of let's say 90. Save it. Let's go back to Brave, refresh it. And as you can see, our background has been changed a little bit. Now the default opacity is set to one. So that will be equal to an opacity of 100. Save it. And the color is back to what it was. So what an opacity of 95 means, what we just added, is that our opacity will be 0 0.95. If we change it to 90, save it, refresh the browser, it has been changed a little bit, but let's change it drastically. Let's change it back to 50. So a 0 0.5 opacity. And as you can see, it has been changed to light blue. And if we set it to 10, it's even worse. I hope that you're getting the point. It will be useless for me to show you all the values because it will take a while. Something that I personally like, and you're probably seeing in the thumbnail of this video, is a gradient background color. So let's go back to Tailwind's website and let's go back to the top and let's search for gradient. Now the option that we need is the background image linear gradients. So let's open it. And before we talk about the class names, let's start with the properties this time. Whenever you want to add a gradient background in CSS, you need to set the background dash image equal to the linear gradient function, as you can see right here. Then inside the function, you need to specify the directions that you would like to have. Do you want your gradient to go to the top? Then your class name is BG gradient dash two dash T, which stands for to the top. You have all these classes right here with different directions. You can go to the top, to the top right, to the right, to the bottom right, to the bottom, to the bottom left, to the left, and to the top left. These are so-called corner directions which will indicate where your color gradient will fade to. So let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code since we're going to change up our background a little bit. If we remove the background color that we added and the opacity and replace it with BG dash gradient dash to the bottom. So dash two dash P. Save it, go back to our local host, refresh it and as you can see, Nothing has been added, since we obviously need to define the color as well. Right now, it has no clue what type of color has been defined. To do that, we can use the same colors that we've seen with the background color and text color, but it needs to be added in a different prefix. So what we need to do is to add a space, say that we want to go from dash blue dash 300 to dash blue dash 700. So our starting point is 300 and we want to increase the level of our blue to 700 in a gradient fashion. Save it, go back to Brave. And as you can see, it has a pretty smooth overlay. Keep in mind that adding the two is optional. What will happen if we remove it, let's test it out, save it, go back. As you can see right now, the gradient will shade now what will happen is that the background color will shade towards a transparent background. In our case, it will be white since the root of our project has a white background. The last color prefix that we could add is the via method, which will add a color in between the from and the to. If we go back to Visual Studio Code and Control Z to add our 2 blue 700 color, go right after it and let's say that we want to add a color via dash black. This will add a black color in between the gradient overlay. Save it. Let's navigate back to Brave. And as you can see, we got a gradient with three colors right now, which is something I do not recommend you to do, but it is useful to know.
When you're using pure CSS, it's very easy to add a full background image that is responsive, has no repeat, and fits perfectly. And you can obviously achieve that in Tailwind. But this kind of difference in Tailwind does provide utilities on how the image is being displayed, but it does not handle the image itself. In CSS, you need to define the background image with a URL function. And in Tailwind, you can either use the style attribute of your DOM element, or you can create your own CSS utility class. So let's start off by using the style attribute, since creating our own class is something for another video. The first thing that we need to do is to find an image. So what we need to do is to navigate to the browser. Let's open a new tab and go to pixabay.com. And in here, you can find a complete library with three images that we can use. I recommend you to choose a picture that you'd like. I will just choose a random one. Now we don't want to download the image and put it in the image folder. Just right click on it, open the image in the new tab, and let's copy the URL. Now let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code. Let's remove all the classes that we have in our div, since we're not going to use that. All right. Now let's add a style attribute. And in here, we're going to set the background dash image equal to the function called URL. And inside the function, we're going to add single quotes and pass the URL. Even though we're using the DOM element, we still need to close it off with a semicolon at the end. If we save it, navigate back to the browser, go to our local host tab, refresh it, and you can see that our image is not showing up. Let's check that. Let's inspect the page again. Let's open our body element, and you can see that our background image has been set. And once again, you can see that we do have a width, but the height is zero. So it's impossible to show an image. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code, and let me actually align it on the line below. Now let's add a class. Now to make the image full screen, we need to set the image width to w-full, and the height as well, so height, so h-full. If we save it, navigate back to the browser, let me close off my elements. Right now, you can see that we indeed added the image as a full screen, but the image is being repeated. And this is happening because it's making the image full screen and not the parent element itself. And of course, Tailwind has a solution for this, which is the background repeat. Now the default value is bg-repeat. So what we could do is to say bg-repeat in our class, save it, go back to Brave, refresh it, and nothing is happening because it's already a default value. Now there are three options how you can stop this. So let's do that first. Let's go back to Visual Studio Code. And after the repeat, let's add a dash. And let's cancel the X axis. Save it, refresh it. And as you can see, there is no repeat at the bottom. To completely remove duplication, we could basically remove the bg-repeat-x and say bg-no-repeat. What this will do is basically add no repeat to the X and Y axis. Save it, refresh the browser, and we can see our image. What we've done so far was removing duplication and white space, but the image itself is still not full screen. Now for that, we need to do something with the background size. Since by default, Tailwind says background images to auto, so the default size of an image. What we need to do is to set it equal to bg-contain. And this will scale the background image to the outer edges without cropping or stretching. Save it, refresh it, and as you can see, it has been stretched to the bottom, but still not to the right. For that, we need to use another styling. Instead of saying contain, we need to set it equal to cover. What this will do is basically scaling the background image to the right and bottom. So it's making a full background image. Save it, refresh it, and as you can see, the image has been full screened. And whenever I work on Tailwind projects, this is actually the way that I use. It's also possible to specify how a background image should be positioned. And to show that, we need to go to Tailwind site to see what the positions can be. In the search bar, let's search for background position. And right here, you can see a total of nine utility classes that you can apply to your background. The properties of these classes basically created to position your background image on certain positions on your website. If we scroll down to the usage part, 
you can see that you can position a background image to the left top, to the top, right top, and so on. You might think that this is useless since we're already having the background image full screen, but you will see a difference. So let's try it out. Let's go back to Visual Studio Code and let's add a class of bg-left. If we save it, navigate back to the browser and refresh it, you can see that the position has been changed a little bit of our background image and the focal point of our background image has been changed. Let me show it to you one more time. Let's remove bg-left, save it, refresh the page, and as you can see, it has been placed a little bit down. This obviously depends on what type of image you're using, but you can play around with it to get your vocal point right in the middle of your image or to the left or to the right. The last topic for today will be scrolling in Tailwind. Most of the websites that I've developed have a parallax effect when scrolling the landing page, because it is something that I really like. It has never been difficult to do it in CSS since you only need to set the background attachment to fixed. And in Tailwind, you need to give the class that has the image a new class of bg-fixed. Now we do need to have some content below our image. If we go to Brave, we can scroll down to the bottom. So let's create a new div right below our parent element. Let's create a div and let's give it a class of height. So h-4 forward slash 5, which will be 80%. If we save it, navigate back to the browser, refresh it, scroll down, you can see a pretty cool parallax effect that we have created. Most of you guys will be familiar with padding and margin in CSS. But before we dive into the code, let's actually go over it real quick. I've created the picture in Photoshop to showcase you what padding and margin is. So let me open it, right here. I know it doesn't look good, but it will showcase you what padding and borders and margins are. Margin and padding will be applied on your content. And in our case, Tailwind is awesome is the content. So let's imagine that it's an H1. Whenever you apply padding to an element, you're adding spacing around the content, but still inside the border of the element. Padding and margin can be added in four different directions. We got padding to the top, we got padding to the right, we got padding to the bottom, and we got padding to the left. In CSS and in Tailwind, you're allowed to specify padding directions separately, horizontally, vertically, or all together. But that's something that we'll discuss when we apply it in Tailwind. Outside of the padding, there's a border, and this is basically the edges around your padding. Then outside the content padding and border, you can apply margin, which is also spacing between certain elements. Just like padding, you can specify margin directions in the same exact way. If we navigate to the browser right now, go to Tailwind's website and let's search for padding. Right here, you can see an entire list, well actually 245 classes that you can apply in order to manage your padding. I won't be going over all of them, otherwise the video will be hours and hours long, but I will tell you more about the class names and properties. So let me scroll up. As you can see in the class names, there's a pattern right here, since all classes start with the letter P, which obviously stands for padding. If we look at the properties of P-0, you can see that the padding has been set to zero for every single direction. So to the top, right, bottom, and left. Inside this list, you can see that the padding starts with 0.5, which will have a padding of 0.125 rem. So one padding, as you can see right here, stands for 0.25 rem. If we scroll down, you can see that the last number is P-96, which is a padding of 24 rem. After the P-96, you can see that the class names change up a little bit, since a new character has been added right here. Now this character defines the direction. Like I showed you in the picture, we got four directions, top, right, bottom, and left. But we could also apply padding horizontally and vertically. So if you're going to apply PY, you're going to add padding to the Y axis. So to the top and to the bottom of an element. If we scroll down, you can see that we could also apply PX right here, padding to the X axis which will apply padding to the left and to the right of an element. And this goes up until you reach the size of 96 again. Next to the X and Y direction, you can see that we have P 
PT, which is padding to the top. So you can style them individually as well. PR, so padding to the right. PB, padding to the bottom. And PL, so padding to the left. These work in the same exact way as the others that we just talked about. So I think it's time to test out padding inside our code and then move on to the margin. Let's go back to Visual Studio Code. Let's remove the div that we have right here. And let's actually remove the styling and the class that we added in our parent element. All right, inside our divs, let's create an H1. And let's say Tailwind. Inside our H1, let's create a class. And let's give it a name of bg-red-500 for the background color. Let's change the text to dash white. Let's add a width of max. So width-max. If we save it, go back to Brave and look at our local host. Let me actually zoom in. You can see that Tailwind has been printed out with a red background color. The actual content and the borders are right next to each other. So what we could do right now is apply padding to it. Now let's start off by adding padding to every single direction. Let's go back to Visual Studio Code. Let's say that we want to set the P-4. So right now we're going to add one RAM to all directions that we have. If we save it, navigate back to the browser, you can see that we added space inside the element. So we made the background color wider than it was. Let's say that you don't want to add padding to all directions, but only to the top and to the bottom. What we then need to do is to say P Y axis is equal to four. Save it, go back. And as you can see, there's no padding to the left or to the right of our element. I think that this is pretty straightforward. So let's talk about margins right now, since you've got a couple more options right there. If we navigate back to the browser, and let me actually zoom out. We're not going to work with padding anymore, but right to the left, you can see that we're going to work with margin. Now let me zoom in. All right. Now I think that most of these classes right now speak for itself, right? The M-1, dash two. The class that I want to talk about is the margin dash auto. So let's scroll down and search for it right here. What this allows you to do, and the reason why it is so powerful, is that you can center elements within the parent container. And to show this to you, we actually need to go back to Visual Studio Code. Now inside our parent element, so our first div, let's give it a class of bg-blue-500. And let's also set the height and width to full. So w-full and h-full. Save it, go back to the browser, refresh our local host, and as you can see, the background has been changed to blue, which is all right. Here comes the tricky part or the fun part. You don't want the content inside your parent container to be 100%. You don't want Tailwind to be aligned to the left, but let's say somewhere right here. What we could do is navigate back to Visual Studio Code and insert our div right below our parent element. Let's give it a class. What you could do is adding a background color of BG-Red-500 to our child div, give it a height of full, but instead of giving it a width of 100% as the parent element, we're going to say that everything inside our child div has a width of W-4 forward slash five, so 80%. If we save it, navigate back to the browser, you can see that 20% is still blue to the right. And that is correct since four forward slash five is 80% out of 100. What you usually want is to put your child div inside the middle. So you don't want to have 20% to the right, but you rather have 10% to the left and 10% to the right. To do that, we need to set the margin left and margin right to auto. And there's where the margin auto comes into play. Instead of saying M dash auto, we're going to say margin X dash auto. If we save it and navigate back to the browser, you can see that we indeed have divided the 20% to the left and to the right of our child element. Next to adding margin auto to the left and to the right, there's a class that will add margin auto to the top and to the bottom. But surprisingly, it has no effect. This needs to be fixed with alignments, which we will cover later on in this course. But let me still show you what goes wrong if we try it. If we navigate back to Visual Studio Code and replace height-full with height-4 forward slash 5, save it, go to Brave, 
you can see that we got 20% of space to the bottom. If we change our margin, if we change our MX dash auto to margin dash auto, so auto in every single direction, save it, refresh it, you can see that this does not work. Another pretty cool thing is that margin can be negative. What this will do is basically move an element closer to another. The only difference between a positive margin and a negative margin is the fact that you need to add a dash right in front of your class name. So let's do that. Let's go back to Visual Studio Code. And let's say that we want to add a dash ML, so margin left of 20. If we save it, navigate back to the browser, you can see that even though we added a margin auto, our child element is still placed to the left since we added a negative margin of 20 to it. I won't be going too in depth on what grid actually is since I have a complete video on it with CSS, which will be linked in the description down below. In the next video, we're going to use Flexbox and there are a lot of discussions on which one is better. The people here that follow me for a while know that I hate to make comparisons of what is better than another. I prefer to light out the positive things of both of them instead of down talking one. If you want to use something that is easy to work with, floats and positions easy, Flexbox is pretty cool to use then. But if you want to fine tune your layout, overlap items, create designs like two or three column layouts, CSS Grid is the way to go. So no, I'm not saying that one is better than another, they are both very useful in different scenarios. If we navigate back to the browser, open the Tailwind tab that we had from the previous video, let's click on the search icon and let's type in grid. You can see a drop down right here with a couple grid options. Let me actually zoom in. All right. But it's not like the others where you find everything that's related to grid in one specific video. The main reason is that grid is a bit more complex than the other topics. So therefore, the grid topics have been separated in different chapters. Tailwind provides a lot of utilities that you can use in order to picture perfect your grid layout system. The first class that we need to provide in order to set up our grid isn't listed right here. Whenever you want to work with the grid layout system in CSS, you need to set the display equal to grid. And since there's only one class and one property for that, Tailwind decided not to add it right there. We will do it in a second, since we need to add it at the top level of our grid. Otherwise the system will not understand what you're doing if you're applying other grid stylings. Then you can define your columns and rows for that specific grid. So let's start off with the column first. We need an option that's not available in the drop down menu. So right after grid, let's add a space. Let's say template, because we need the columns. Now let's click on the first option, and in the left sidebar you can see the grid options that you have right here. But for now, let's actually zoom in. As you can see, we have class names and properties right here. The class name speaks for itself. We're going to define a grid, dash, columns, so calls, followed with the number of columns you want to define. This will start from 0, and it will go up to 12 grids. If you want to define one grid layout, which is something you probably won't do, you're going to add a class of grid-calls-1. If you want to have grid items next to each other, you're going to use the grid-calls-2 up until you reach 12. If we take a look at the properties that we have right here, you can see a repeat function being called. This will basically repeat the first param, so 1, 2, 3, and so on. And what it will repeat is the 1fr. If you're defining grid calls 2, you're saying, well, repeat it twice, and what it needs to repeat is 1fr. Now, inside this list, you can see that 1fr is being called quite a lot. fr stands for a fraction. And this can be used when you want to define your grid like any other CSS length. Think about percentages, pixel values, or m's. If we then navigate back to Visual Studio Code, create a new div inside our body, when working with grids, I prefer to use my parent div element as the grid layout. Inside your parent element, you can create divs, articles, and so on for every single fraction. What we need to do is to give a class to our parent element. So let's say class. What we want to do is to set it equal to a grid. And then we're going to say, well, I want a grid-calls-2. 
So I want to have two fractions inside the div, so two blocks or two grid items, whatever you want to name it. Before this works, well, let's actually save it and go to the browser, refresh our local host. Uh, let me actually zoom in, all right. This doesn't work since we haven't defined our grid items. Right now, it's not recognizing anything inside the parent element that we got since it's empty. So what we need to do is to navigate back inside our parent element, create a new div. Let's give it a class of bg-red-500. Let's change the text to white and let's give it a height of 24. Then inside our div, let's create a paragraph with the text of this is my first grid item. Below our first grid item, we could actually duplicate it. So copy it, paste it right there. And let's change the second background color to blue. This is not my first grid item anymore, but my second one. If we save it and navigate back to the browser, you can see that we aligned our second grid item to the right and we defined our grid layout system of two columns. A cool thing about grid is the fact that you don't need to specify your rows. CSS will automatically fill in the next rows based on the number of columns you have declared. So whenever we add a new div to our grid, which we will do in a second, it will automatically detect that it needs to be placed right below the first one, since we're saying that we want a maximum of two columns. As you can see right now, the columns are aligned next to each other without spacing in between. You can indeed fix this by adding margin, but Grid has a pretty cool feature which lets you define the gap between the columns. Let's go to the Tailwind tab that we have, scroll up, and let's search for Gap. In here, you will find a complete list of classes that you can apply in order to add spacing in different directions. The one that we will use, and you probably will use most of the time, is the default Gap dash a value. So let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code and let's apply grid gap. When you want to apply a gap in between your grid columns or rows, you need to apply it to your parent element. So the div of your grid class. So right here, let's say that we want to set the gap equal to dash four. If we save it and navigate back to the browser, go to our local host, you can see that there has been added a space right here in between our two columns. And here comes the most important one. This does not shift your columns to the right, so outside of your full width. This will basically make the columns you've got a tiny bit smaller so it fits inside your width. Another pretty cool thing about grid, and I know that I'm saying that grid has a lot of cool things, is the fact that you can specify a start and ending point for an element inside the grid. You can basically specify how many rows or columns an element should take up. Before we do that, we actually need to add some more grid items. So let's do that. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code and let's change our grid calls two to three. Let's duplicate our grid item. All right. Let's change the third one to BG yellow. And let's call it this third grid item. And let's actually do it one more time. And let's call this one, or give it a color of BG purple 500. And this is my fourth grid item. If we save it and navigate back to the browser, you can see that we got four boxes with different colors, but they all got the same size. So do you always want to have that? What if you want your first grid column, so the red one, to have a span of two columns instead of one? And that's what I like about grid, it's so easy. What we need to do is to navigate back to Visual Studio Code, go to the, well, grid item that we want to span out, and let's give it a class of cool dash span dash two. So we're basically going to say that the first column needs to be spanned out to the second one. If we save it and navigate back to the browser, you can see that indeed everything has shifted one column to the right and our first column has a width of two columns now. This can also be done for rows, but be aware that the height of your element needs to be full. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code and right after our call span two, let's give it a, you guessed it, row dash span dash two. Let's save it. Let's go to Brave you can see that it has indeed been shifted to the bottom as well, 
but our first grid item has a height of 66%, so the background color does not completely fit in here. What we can do is to navigate back, and let's say the height-24 is height-full. Save it, navigate back, and this is the output that we need. In the last video, we touched on grid and I thought I'd make a separate video on Flexbox even though you might think that the idea behind it is pretty much the same. And to be honest, it kind of is, but a huge difference is the fact that grid layout is two-dimensional and Flexbox is one-dimensional. Whenever you are in a dubio on which one to use, keep in mind that Flexbox has a better way of dealing with sizes of elements. It can also be nested, which means that you can start with a Flexbox row but elements inside the row could be flexbox columns. As you can see, I've added two headers on my page. The first one is the grid section, and the second one is for my flexbox. And that's what I want to do right now. And that's what I want to do right now. I want to start off with a layout, and then I want to move on to adding flexbox. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code. Right below our H2, which you probably don't have, but recreate it. Let's create a div, which will be our parent element. In here, let's create another div with a class of bg-red-500. Let's make the text white and let's give it a height of 26. Inside the div, let's create a paragraph with a text of flex item one. What I want to do right now is to duplicate it twice. So let's do that. All right. The second one has a background color of blue. It's flex item number two. The third one has a color of yellow and it's flex item number three. If we save it and navigate back to the browser, you can see that our divs got printed out vertically, so right below each other. And this is all right because we haven't applied flexbox to it. We got to go back to Visual Studio Code, scroll up to our parent element right here. Let's apply a class to it called flex. With this, another class is pretty important, which is wrapping your flex. By default, a flex box is not wrapped, which is the class of flex-no-wrap. But what you do want to do is to set your flex equal to wrap, so just like this. This will make sure that your row container will automatically move items to the next row if the item would overflow the main axis of the container. If we save it and navigate back to the browser, you can see that our flex items have been aligned horizontally right now. This is what the foundation is of Flexbox, the directions. Right now it is horizontally, but you can obviously set it back to vertically. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code and let's add a class to it of flex call Save it, go back to Brave, and as you can see, the output has indeed been changed. Another cool thing is the fact that you can reverse the values. So right now it's the order that we want to see, one, two, three. But let's say that we want to start off with three. Instead of copy pasting and reordering it, we could basically say, well, we have a class called flex cool reverse. If we save it, navigate back to the browser, you can see that the first item that we have is flex item three, then two, and then one. The next topic is actually a pretty fun one, which is the orders with flex, since you can't specifically order your elements. To showcase you this in the best possible way, I'd like to navigate back to Tailwind's website, and let's search for order. In here, you can see 12 classes that you can use, which is the same exact number as the grid and flex columns and rows that you can define. By adding one of these classes, you can determine which element should be first, second, third, and so on. Now besides the 12 default classes, you've got three more classes. The first one is order-first, which will be the first element that will be shown. Then we got order-last, which will be the last element. And order-none is this one right here, is basically none. You might wonder when you will be using these orders, since you can easily change up the order yourself. Whenever you want your main content to come before the other elements in the source order, but you still display it correctly, you'll be using this. Let's navigate back to Visual Studio Code. And before we can apply this to our class, we need to remove flex call reverse. What we could do next is to basically say 
that our flex item two has a order dash one. So it's the first item. Let's say that flex item one is order dash two. And let's say that the last one is order dash three, which it already is. Save it, navigate back to the browser. Let's go to our local host. And as you can see, flex item two comes first, then one and then three. Right now, the output is still not the same as what we did before with grid, since the elements are full width and placed next to each other. This can be done with the grow and shrink method in Flexbox. There are two classes that you can use in order to let a flex item fill in the available space. The first one is flex-grow-0. This makes sure that your item can't grow. Now besides that, you can use another function. Let's go back to Visual Studio Code. And let's actually remove our orders first, because it will be annoying. All right. Now inside our flex item number one, let's add a flex dash auto class. If we save it, navigate back to Brave, you can see that flex item one took all the space that was available next to the size of flex item two and three. Now if we add the same class to our flex dash two, so flex dash auto, Save it, refresh it. You can see that the available space has been divided between flex item one and flex item two. The same exact thing can be done to shrink a flex item. This would decrease the size of an element. I'm not going over it since it's exactly the same way as growing an element. Our flex items are allied next to each other. You can add spacing right here in the same exact way as adding spacing to grid items. Let's double check that. Let's go back to Tailwind. Let's search for a gap. You can see that gap is a utilities for controlling gutters between grid and flexbox items. So let's go back to Visual Studio Code. Let's go up to our parent element and let's say gap-4. And we could basically say that we want to set the height to full. Save it, go back to Brave, localhost. And as you can see, we have three items right here with spacing. I want to change the layout of my screen for this video since we're going to refresh the page quite a lot. So what I want to do is to put my browser to the right here. So let me actually do that. All right, and let's make it smaller. And I don't need a sidebar in Visual Studio Code, so let me close it as well. And I actually think that this is quite better than what we had. We've all seen websites where you can hover over elements and the background color, text color, or font sizes change. And this is being done with a CSS pseudo class called hover. Whenever a user hover with his mouse over certain elements, the element will change. And in order to test this out, we need to create an anchor first. Let's actually remove what we had from Flexbox and Grid. What I usually like to do is to wrap my anchor element inside a div. So let's do that. And let's create an anchor in here with the text of click me. The reason why I do this is because I can ally my div right in the middle of my screen. Let's give our div a class of w-4 forward slash five, so a width of 80%. Let's set the margin left and right to auto, so mx dash auto. So we get 10% to the left and 10% to the right of our element. Let's also add a text-center to center the element. And in order to add spacing between the element and the top of our page, let's set the padding, so the PY axis, to 12. I don't want to use paragraphs since hovering over paragraphs does not make sense and an answer does. So let's go to the local host that we have. Let's save our page. And well, I have a typo right there. Click me has been printed out, but it has no styling. So let's add styling to our href. And let me actually align it because it looks better. Let's give it a class of bg-blue-500. And let's change the text to text-white. Save it, and this starts to look better. I don't want to have my text aligned to the borders. So let's set the py equal to four. And this will add padding to the top and bottom. And let's set the px equal to eight. And this will make the button wider. Then I'm going to add a class that we haven't used in this course before, which is called rounded. Save it. And as you can see, the borders of our button has changed. 
Tailwind provides nine basic rounded options, which will be the same as the text size. So you have rounded, small, medium, large, XL, double XL, and triple XL. What this will do is basically adding a border of 0.25 rem to our element. Now the last class that I want to add is text-xl. And this just made our button a little bit bigger. We can all tell that it's a button and it's clickable, but it would even be better if we could add a hover effect when we hover over our button. When you want to define a hover in Tailwind, you got to use a prefix inside your class with the name of hover. So let's do that. Right here. Let's say hover. Then we need to add a colon because we are going to set the hover effect equal to something. Now the value can be anything you want, since you can apply hover with any Tailwind utility that you have. In our case, let's change the background color to bg-blue-300, which will be a lighter color than it is. If we save it and hover over our element, you can see that the background color does change from 500 to 300. Usually when you apply hover, you also be adding some kind of transition to your element in order to make the transition actually happen gradually. If we open our Tailwind tab and search for transition, we need the transition property, so the third value. And let me actually zoom out. All right. By default, an element has no transition. So the transition dash none is applied. But when you do want to apply transition, you usually do it on certain properties like the background color, text color, borders, shadows, and so on. If that's the case, you can apply the transition dash all class that we have right here. This will set transition property on for everything and the transition duration is 150 milliseconds. Right after our hover, let's add the transition dash all. Save it, go to our local host, hover our element, and as you can see, there's a pretty smooth transition that has been applied with a transition duration of 150 milliseconds. A cool thing about Tailwind is that you can get the option to limit the transitions for certain properties. If we go back to our Tailwind tab, you can see that we are allowed to add transition individually for the color, opacity, shadow, and transform. But this works a little bit different since you do need to specify the duration as well. So inside our code editor, let's change transition all to transition color. If we save it and go to our local host, you can see that we have no transition anymore since the transition dash color that we have has a default transition duration of zero. So what we could do is to go back to Tailwind and search for transition duration. You can see a total of eight duration classes that are available right here. It starts from 75 milliseconds and it can go up to 1000 milliseconds. The name is actually pretty straightforward. It's the duration dash the amount of milliseconds of the duration. So what we could do is to go right after our transition color and add a class of duration dash let's say 200. Let's save it. Let's go back to our local host. And as you could see, a pretty smooth transition effect has been added. The last transition that I'd like to show you is the transition delay. As the name implies, this will delay the start of the transition. It works in the same exact way with the same exact durations, but instead of saying duration, we have to say delay dash 200. If we save it and hover over our answer, you can see that it takes 200 milliseconds before the hover effect is being shown. Whenever you want to apply animations in CSS, you're going to make use of keyframes. And Tailwind has four predefined utility classes that you can use for keyframes, and they are pretty easy to use. If we go back to Tailwind tab and search for, let's say, animation, it's the first option. Scroll down you can see the different types of animation properties or classes that we can use. We got animation-spin, ping, pulse, and bounce. Now the spin class will rotate an object, as you could see right here, from zero degree to 360 degrees. And the time for it is one second. So it will spin one second linear infinite. Be aware that animations can only be applied to images or SVG values. Animate ping will ping out the image in one second from regular size to a scale of two. 
Animate Plus will add two seconds transitions, as you could see right here, between 1 and 0 0.5 opacity. The last one, which is Animate Dash Bounce, will add a one second, once again, as you could see right here, transition where the vertical position will go down with 25%. So the translate Y axis will go minus 25. Like I said, in order to test them out, we need to use an image. So let's open a new tab and let's go to pixabay.com. And well, you can choose whatever image you like. I'll just choose a random one that we have, let's say right here. Let me open it in a new tab. And let's copy the URL and let's close off both tabs. Right below our answer, let's create an image tag. Let's paste our URL right there and let me align it on the line below as well. We don't need the alt, so let's replace it with a class. And let's apply the class of animate spin, which is the first one in the list. Let's save it. Let's go back to our local host. As you can see, something that I personally never use since I'm already getting a headache is that our image is being spinned all the time. Inside the code editor, we can replace animate spin with animate dash ping. Save it. The image is being pinged out and this is once again, something that I'll probably never use. Then we got the pulse class, so animate pulse. And this will change the opacity from 1 to 0 0.5 every second. And the last one is the animate dash bounce class. And the image is being bounced down. And this is actually something that you might use because it is something that you see quite a lot on web pages when they have a landing screen with an arrow down where you can click on. The last topic of today will be transformation in Tailwind. In pure CSS, you can easily add size, location, rotation, or skew transformations. Tailwind made a couple default transformations that you can apply on certain elements. Whether you're adding transformation for the size, location, rotation, or skew, you got to keep in mind that you have to specify the default transformation class. If we remove the animate-bounce, we need to apply the transform class to the same element where we're going to add transformation to. Now that transform has been applied, we can continue on with scaling the image. And this is something that I personally like to use. It will zoom in an element by making the element bigger when hovering. And in order to define it, we need to apply the scale class. So let's go back to Tailwind step. Let's search for scale. It's the first one. And right here, you can see all the scaling classes that you can apply. You can apply it in every single direction, which is scale dash value. But if we scroll down, you can see that we can add scale on the X axis and the Y axis as well. If we add a hover, and let's say that we want to hover it to scale dash 125. And what this will do is basically scale the image to 125% of the origin of the image when we hover the element. If we save it and go to our local host, you can see that we indeed scaled the image, but the output is actually pretty ugly because there is no transition. So right inside of our class, the order does not really matter. You can add it right in front of the hover or right after. But what I personally like is to keep related classes together. So right after transform, let's add a transition dash all to it. Save it, test the output, and this is actually pretty good looking. You can also apply rotations to an element. And this is not in percentages like we have with the scaling, but this will be a degree. And the degree can be 1, 2, 3, 6, 12, 45, and 90. So what we could do is to replace the hover scale to 125 with rotate dash 45. Hover the image, and we have rotated the image with 45 degrees. You can also skew an image. And to be honest, it's pretty difficult to explain what this will do. So let me actually show it to you. Keep in mind that skewing can only be applied into the X and Y axis. Let's replace rotate dash 45 with skew dash x, so the x axis dash 6. Hover over our image, and the image has been skewed for 6 degrees. Since we're on the topic of moving elements, we can also apply translate on an element, and this will move an image to the x or y axis. So if we remove our skew one more time and replace it with translate dash x dash 4, 
hover over the image. And as you could see, we have moved our image to the right direction. At this point in the course, you will probably be familiar with most of the stylings you can apply with Tailwind, but they all work well on a big screen. What about smaller screens? How do you make your grid or flexbox suitable for smartphones or tablets? As a designer, you need to think about multiple sized screens, since there are over 5 billion mobile phone users on the planet that we live in. Something that has stuck with me when I started using Tailwind is that it is defined for mobile first. And I will repeat myself a couple times in this tutorial since it is so important, and a lot of newcomers to Tailwind do get confused with the mobile design first approach. Before Tailwind became a thing, responsive designs were developed with media tags. Tailwind thought it was quite a hassle to fix that, and they were actually true because it was annoying. What they did was bringing out their own utility classes which allows you to control the set of a screen size. With the media tag, you define a breaking point where content or your design should change. But instead of designing the pixels, you can use Tailwind screen width, which will make it a lot easier. The main advantage for me personally is the fact that I always had small design issues when I use CSS to design mobile pages. With Tailwind, that issue will be completely gone. All the utility classes that we have used in this course, and even all the utility classes that we haven't used, can be applied at different breaking points in Tailwind. If we go to the Tailwind tab and search for responsive, let me backspace it, responsive design, scroll down, you can see five screen widths that are associated with a minimum media width. We got SM right here, which stands for small screens, and this will be all screens with a minimum width of 640 pixels. We got MD, which stands for medium, which has a minimum width of 768 pixels. We got LG, which is large, which has a minimum width of 1024 pixels. We got extra large, which has a minimum width of 1280 pixels. And the last one, which is extra large, so 2XL, has a minimum screen width of 1536 pixels. Let me make the screen a little bit bigger. All right. It's also very simple to use since you only need to define the breaking prefix, just like with hovers. Down here, you can see an example. Let's have a look at it. Let me zoom in. At the moment, the default width is W-16. Whenever a medium screen will be opened or your browser just has a minimum width of 768 pixels, the width will change to 32. Then on large screens, you're saying that the width should be 48. So the width of our page will grow based on the device that you're using. Right here, you can see that we're using utility classes for two different breaking points, the medium screen and the large screen. You might wonder what W-16 or a width-16 is, since we're already defining the medium screen and large screen. Like I said, the idea behind Tailwind is that you define your design for mobile first. Then you use prefixes and then design your screen for other breaking points. So in our case, we're going from 16, which is our mobile phones, to 32 and then to 48. So let's make our code editor bigger again and let's remove what we have in here. So what I want to do is to create a grid as an example since it's pretty easy and straightforward to show. So let's create a div. In here, let's create another div with a class of bg-red-500. And let's create a paragraph with a text of item one. Now let's duplicate it four times. So two, three, four. Change the second one to item two and the color is blue. Third one is item three and the background color is yellow. The fourth one is item four with the background color of purple. Let's save it. Let's go to our local host. And as you can see, we have four items right here, which is fine. In order to create a responsive design, once again, we have to think mobile first. So let's go to our parent element and let's give it a class of grid, since we're going to define a grid. Then we have to define our columns. And on mobile phones, I just want one column to be shown first and I don't want the items next to each other. So let's give it a class of grid calls one. If we save it, nothing changes because it is the same output. 
Whenever the screen width has a minimum of 640 pixels, so a SM screen, I'm going to place two grid items next to each other. So let's give it a class of grid-cools-2. We still have one grid item, but if we make the screen bigger, well, let's do that. And somewhere right here. All right, that was our breaking point. Right now, our SM, so small device width, has been reached. Now let's make it smaller again, and let's say that whenever the medium width has been reached, give it a grid-cools-3 class. So three columns next to each other. And let's also define the last one. So whenever we reach large screens, let's place four grid items next to each other. So grid-cools-4. And let's actually test it out. Let's see if we can get three columns. Probably not. All right. This looks better. You should set your percentage or your zoom to 50. And let's go to a small device. I can't zoom in, which is terrible. We have four items right there. I might make this one smaller. Nah. Grow, 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 grow. We have our SM screen. So two grid items next to each other. Make it bigger. We have three items next to each other. And the last one is the biggest one, which is large. So we have four items next to each other. What we're doing right now is adding breakpoints inside our parent element. Let me close off my inspect element and make this smaller. What we also could do is to add it to our child elements. So let's say the div that we have right here. Let's say that whenever it reaches the SM device, hide this element. So let's add hidden to it. Save it, make our screen bigger, and let's go to the breaking point that is right here. Our first item is gone because we said that whenever it reaches the small device width, hide the element. Now this is pretty cool in my opinion, but what if we add another class to it? So let's say that on small devices, we want our text to be white. Save it. As you can see, something is going wrong right here because the text is still white, but we still added it, as you could see, right after the SM prefix. Whenever you want to add multiple classes for a specific screen width, you do have to define the breakpoint again. Whenever we want to add text white to small devices, we have to add a SM prefix right in front of it. If we save it, you can see that the text color has been changed to black again. If we make our screen bigger, you can see that it has been changed to white. At the beginning of this course, we've talked about font families and I've showed you that there are three default font families that you can use. We got the font sans, serif, and mono. If we don't add a font family to our index.html page, it will automatically use the font sans class. You might come in a situation where you just don't want that and you want a completely different font that is not available in the list that Tailwind provides for us. You don't want to go into a meeting with a client saying that they can only choose out of these three fonts. Most of the people get their custom font on Google Fonts. So let's open a new tab and let's go to fonts.google.com. Let me make it bigger. What you need to do right now is to search for a font that you like. I will just choose a random one that is different than the available default Tailwind classes. So let me actually search for a font called Shadows into Light. Let's click on it. What we need to do is to select this font and a sidebar pops up where we can insert our head tag right here that you're probably familiar with, but that still doesn't do the trick for us since we can't add it into our classes. What we need to do and something that we have done in the first video of this course is using the add import. So let's do that and let's copy the import without the style tags. Let's make the screen smaller. Now let's go back to Visual Studio Code. We need to place this right inside the style.css file where we imported our base, components, and utility classes. It's the style.css file in our root. Click on it. And let's go right in front of the first one and let's paste it right here. This will import the shadow into light font into our style.css file. It still doesn't give us the opportunity to use it since we need to create a new class name that will refer to this import right here. If we zoom in, you can see that there is a CSS rule right here with the font family that you probably know from CSS. But what we need is the first value, so shadows into light. Copy it, 
open the tailwind convict file because we need to define a new class right here. Inside the extent, let's hit enter. And what we're going to do right here is to call a predefined tailwind class called font family colon curly braces. And let's hit enter. We need to define a font family name that we can use inside our index.html file. Keep it similar to the font name that we copied from Google Fonts. So in single quotes, let's call it shadows. Let's add a colon. And what we're going to set it equal to is what we just copied. The utility name that we have defined right here will be a little bit different since Tailwind will automatically add a font dash in front of shadows. So if we define shadows right here, Tailwind will convert it to font dash shadows. Now it won't work if we just save it and close off the file. Let's actually do that for our style sheet right here. Let's close it off. What we need to do is to rebuild our CSS where our new class will be added to. We did create a npm command. So let's open the terminal again. Let's perform npm run build dash CSS. Let's hit enter and this will rebuild our style.css file as you can see right here. It has been placed into CSS forward slash style.css. So let's open it. Let's actually close off our terminal because we don't need it. Let's open the style.css file inside our CSS folder. As you can see at the top, our import has been added here as well. So let's press command F or control F and let's search for shadows. You can see that font dash shadows has been defined with a font family of shadows into light attached to it. If we go to our local host, refresh the page, it still hasn't been applied. What we need to do is to go to our index.html file and right inside of our body, add a class of font dash. And as you can see in the dropdown, shadows has been added. Save it. And as you can see, our font has been changed drastically. This is not sans, mono, or serif. But let's make the screen a bit bigger. Let's inspect the page. Let's open our body tag. Let me zoom in. Right here, our font family has been changed to shadows into light. In the beginning of this course, we generated a Tailwind Convict file, but we haven't really used it up until the previous video where we added custom fonts to Tailwind. This one right here. And don't get me wrong, most of Tailwind utility classes will do most of the work for you. But sometimes you just want to customize some values, and especially in the color department, since the default values might not be what you need. Or think about the shades. Is it really enough, or do you want to customize shades as well? Besides that, you can easily add new behavior to your Tailwind class. You can create a new CSS file and add it inside your index.html file, but is that really the way to go? Even if you got a current website using CSS or SCSS, you can easily integrate Tailwind since you can add a lot of customized classes in it. If you don't have the tailwind.convict.js file, don't worry, since it's an optional file. If you are alright with all the Tailwind classes that are available, you don't need it. But if you do, or you want to watch this video obviously, you can easily regenerate it. So let's do that first. Let's delete the file. Let's say move to trash. Let's open the terminal. And inside the terminal, let's run mpx space Tailwind CSS in it. And as simple as it is, Tailwind created the convict file for us. This is all right, but if you want to change something up right here, you got to redefine every single class, which might take quite a lot of time if we think about the colors and font sizes, for instance. There's even a way better approach, but we got to delete the file. So let's do it one more time. Inside the terminal, hit the arrow up, and right after in it, let's add a space, double dash, full. This will basically add the entire configuration of Tailwind with all values that are being used in Tailwind. If we open the file again, and let's close off the terminal, you can see that we have a lot more items right here. We have all our different screen sizes, all the different colors, all the different spacing elements, animations, and you know the drill. Scroll through it and you can see everything that we got. Now there are two ways how you could customize your Tailwind styling. You can either override an option in the list right here, then recompile it, 
or you can extend a styling, which will then override it, but your value in the team section will still be available. Even though you might not use it, it is still good to have it. So let's start off by doing that first. Right after 2XL, let's hit enter and let's add a 3XL. So a new breakpoint, colon, and let's give it a random width of 1800 pixels. And let's change the small screen to 340. Now let's save it. Let's open our style.css file inside the CSS folder. Let's hit command or control F and let's search for add media. You can see that the minimum width is 640 and if we scroll down, we don't have one of 1800. Now let's save both files. All right. We actually do need the terminal. So let's open it one more time. Now let me actually make it a bit smaller. All right. So in order to rebuild our CSS file, we need to run npm run build dash CSS. This will take a second, but it's probably not long. Our file has been saved to CSS forward slash style.css. Let's open it and let's go up again right here. You can see that our minimum width, which was the first one, has been changed to 340. And if we scroll down, a minimum width of 1800 has been added as well. Now the downside right now is that we don't know what the value was right here. Well, we actually know, but it wasn't 340. Even if you don't use it again, it's still good to keep it. So what we could do is to go back and let's undo what we just did. Right inside of our team, well, it can be at the top, at the bottom, or in the middle, it doesn't matter. Let's create an extend section, colon curly braces, and we need to add a comma right after the closing curly brace. Inside our extend, we need to redefine what we would like to change. So what we're going to do is to add a new screen. So let's say screens, colon, curly braces. Then in here, let's say that we want to add 3XL with a value of 1800 pixels. Let's save it, let's rebuild our CSS. Let's open the style.css file. You can see that the minimum width has been changed back to 640. And if we scroll down, we still got our 1800 minimum width that we defined in our extent section. Tailwind uses a total of 22 colors, but by default, only 10 are defined. And this is fine if you want to make something quick, but when you're working on custom websites, you do want to define your own colors. So let's do that as well. And in my opinion, it's better to create your own colors rather than overriding the default colors. Inside our extend section, let's add a comma right after the closing curly brace of screen. Then on the line below, let's say colors, curly braces. Let's give our new color a name of gold dash light. And let's set the value equal to hashtag F0E68C. Now let's add a second one as well. So gold dash dark colon, and let's set the value equal to 996515. What this will do is basically adding a text dash gold dash light class inside our style.css file. Right now, gold dash light and gold dash dark haven't been defined by Tailwind, but you could also overwrite a specific shade of let's say red. So let's do that. Right below our gold dash dark, let's add a comma. Let's say red, colon, curly braces. What we need to do right now is to define a new shade. So let's say that we want a shade of 450, colon, with the value of CC0000. Save it, go back to our terminal, hit the arrow up and rebuild our CSS. Let's open our style.css and let's command F and search for text-gold. And right here, you can see that text-gold-light and text-gold-dark have both been defined. Then if we press Command F one more time and search for text-red-450, you can see that we defined a new color of red with a shade of 450. By now, we all know that Tailwind generates tons of classes and you won't be using all of them. Think about all the color classes, sizes, grid classes, and so on. If we right click on our style.css folder and reveal it in Finder, open the CSS folder, 
And right here, you can see that we have a style.css file with a size of 4.7 MB, which is very, very big for styling. With Purge CSS, you have the ability to identify which classes are being used or not. And what it then will do is remove all the stylings that are not being used inside your style.css file. And this is something you got to do when you want to deploy a real life project. Inside our tailwind.convic file, you can see that right below our module.export, we have a purge array, which is defined by Tailwind itself. What we need to do is basically add the files that have Tailwind classes inside our purge. So let's do that. Let's hit enter, single quotes, Instead of defining the index.html file, the about.html file, and so on, you could basically say, well, remove index, add a star, which will get every single .html extension inside our root directory. There might be a case in the future where you have a React project or a JavaScript project. What you then need to do is to add a comma and basically say, get me everything, so a star, with the extension of dot jsx or js or php whatever you like but for now let's focus on the .html extension the next step is adding a post css file manually inside the root of our directory because we need to make sure that tailwind is up and running so let's right click and let's create a new file let's name it postcss.convic.js let's define the module.exports first and let's set it equal to curly braces then we're going to define our plugins, which has curly braces as well. Our first plugin is Tailwind CSS, colon curly braces, but we're not going to hit enter. We're going to add a comma. And on the line below, let's say auto prefixer, colon curly braces and save it. That's it. Let's close the file because we need to open the package.json file since we need to generate a new script that will basically do whatever we want. We already have our build-css script. Then let's add a comma right after. And let's say that we want to call this one prod of production, colon, double quotes, in capitals, node underscore env. And let's set it equal to production. What this will do is making sure that whenever we compile the file, all the unused styles will be purged. Then we need to add a space and write down post CSS, space, the file that we're going to purge. And be careful right here that you don't purge the file with all the Tailwind classes, since we only need to purge the file that we want to import. So that is the style.css file inside our root directory. This one, with the base, component, and utility classes. It's basically stored inside style.css, space, dash O, which is a dash O flag, and then we need to specify the location where we want to place it. Well, let's call it public forward slash style.css. This will generate a public folder with a style.css file inside of it. Before this works, we need to install post-css CLI. Inside the terminal, let's perform npm space i space dash d space post-css space post-css dash CLI. Let's hit enter. And as you can see, the dev dependencies have been added. And what we could do then is to run npm run prod. This might take a second, but the output will be good. All right, we have a public folder right here with a style.css file. And well, let's actually go back to the folder and let's open it. And as you can see, our style.css file has a size of 12 kilobytes. And that's a huge difference if we compare it to the four megabytes that we had. So let's have a look. As you can see, we can scroll through this one pretty easy. We still have the sub and the tables and the buttons and some other stuff that we don't actually want because we thought that we had purged it. But if we press command F and write down grid, we have used grid inside our index.html file right here. And therefore it is still in our style.css file. If we go to the Tailwind website and search for optimizing for production, Scroll down. Let's say that we want to preserving HTML elements. You can see that there are extra options to make the file even smaller than it is. The only thing that you need to do is to go to your tailwind.convic.js file. 
So let's look right here. And inside the purge, you basically need to add preserve HTML elements and set it equal to files and then rebuild it. And the body, the paragraph and the header text will be removed. And if you scroll down the list, you can see a couple other things that you can add in order to remove some extra styling, but it's all optional. This was it for this video where I've showed you how to purge your Tailwind CSS file. If you do like my content and you want to see more, leave this video a thumbs up. And if you're new to this channel, please hit the subscribe button.